entire onion, everything including distribution. You remove distribution, you end up with revision control. Now forget about the revisions. Forget about the idea of versioning itself, okay? Forget about history. Pretend that every project has only one commit. This makes things much easier. Once you remove that layer from the onion, what you're left with is, as Git calls itself, a stupid content tracker. You give it files and directories, it stores the files and directories away. Still too big to swallow. Forget about files and directories. Let's go right to the core of the onion, what you are left with. I would argue, Git is a persistent hash map. Weird, but allow me to show you how. You give Git a piece of content, for example, in this case, the string something, and it gives you back a hash, a 20 bytes hash, okay? And this functionality, like so many functionalities in Git, it's a low-level functionality, but you can actually access it from the command line. There is actually a command, which you can use if you do scripting, for example, that is called the Git hash object. Let me use it, actually. I have a command line here, git hash object. Is this visible to everybody in the room? Now? Still small? Okay, okay. Now everybody, <laughs> okay? Okay. <laughs> okay, now it's expecting something on a file, actually. I don't have a file, so I will say read from standard input instead and I, I will pipe something into it with echo, okay? Uh, something, literally something. For people who don't use Unix-like stuff, I'm mean, essentially streaming this string into this command. And what you are left with is this hash, D-E-B-A, which is the same that I wrote here because it's the same content, same content, same hash every time. This is hugely important in Git. Git uses these SH1 um, hashes everywhere. All of your files get hashed like this. So um, call it SHA1 or shown for friends, okay? So some people who are new to Git say, but of course there are not as many shown as there are possible files. What if I have two files in my project that have the same shown? That would be tragic. And yes, it would be tragic. That would totally break Git. It's probably not going to happen. Uh, let's do a quick calculation just because it's fun. Let's look, for example, at this guy. He won the uh, American, um, ja the jackpot at the American lottery. Plenty of money. Your chances of winning the jackpot at the American lottery with a random combination of numbers are slim. One in 175 million. This uh, number is hard to visualize. Let me visualize it for you. Let's say that I come up with 175 million fortune cookies, and I put a different number in each fortune cookie, including, of course, the jackpot, because it's all of them. Let's say that the fortune cookie is five centimeters long. So you start here in this room, and you track a line of fortune cookies towards Europe. I think it's in that direction, okay? you end up with a very long line, and believe it or not, I googled for it, you end up very close to where I live, okay? You end up around Venice. So now, say that you walk the entire line, okay? It's a long walk, so at some point, you're probably gonna get hungry, so you decide to eat a fortune cookie. You are only allowed one fortune cookie in the entire trip. You open it, and hey, you want the jackpot. So these are your chances of winning the jackpot. So you think, I won, I will win again. This is a gambler, a gambler mindset, right? I'm on a lucky strike, let me do it again. So you come back all the way through with brand new cookies and once again, uh, probably somewhere in Turkey, you get hungry and you eat a cookie and you win again, twice in a row. So your friends now are calling you a lucky bastard and asking you to pay for rounds and stuff. Huh? Okay, the chances of two random shows colliding are not the chances of winning the jackpot once or twice in a row. 
they are the same chances of winning the jackpot 10,000 billions of billions of billions of billion times in a row. Just saying, it's probably not going to happen. Okay? Uh, show, this is important for what comes later. Shones are not unique in your project. They are unique in the universe. You can take every single software project on Earth, put them all into the same Git repo. You get a lot of performance issues, still no clashes. So that's the hash map part. I said the persistent hash map. This one is not persistent yet. To make it persistent, you can actually do it with the minus W switch in, uh, in hash object. And uh, let me do that. Minus W, this is going to break. It's complaining that it doesn't have anywhere to put the object. It lacks its own place, which is the dot git directory. You know that one probably. Well, uh, any git project has a dot git directory in the root. That's where the git stuff goes. Configuration and the object database. So let, let me create the directory. How do I do that? Yep, git init. That's what git init does. It creates the git folder. The dot git folder is here, okay? Mm, let me do it in another folder, sorry. My project, let me remove it from here just in case. And let me move to my project just to avoid the other files in the demo which would probably pollute the demo. Okay, initialize, fine. Now let me open it and if you look inside it, you will see that amongst other things, it has an objects directory. And inside the objects directory, there are a couple of folders, info and pack, ignore these ones for now, okay? There is no object now. Actually, I can ask Git how many objects um, it has in its database. I think it's this command. Yeah, zero objects. You don't have to remember these commands, of course. The point is just understanding how it works, not remembering every step of it. So now I can, once again, generate the hash and save it. There, if you look again into the object directory here, you will see a directory called DE, which is, not coincidentally, the very beginning of this hash. It follows up with BA and so on and so on, and this is the name of the file in here. It generated a file by splitting the name. This is just a way not to put all files into one directory. But Essentially, the file, you can say approximately that the file is named like the hash. And what's in that file? The content, the string something. It's been zipped, it's, it's been wrapped into a small header, but that's what it is. There is another command that I will use that is called the git cat file, and I can pass it this hash, or just the first few. Um, digits in the hash, and if I run it with minus t, it will tell me the type of this thing. It calls it a blob, content. Your files are called blob, blobs inside Git. And if I run it with minus p, it's gonna show the content, something, okay? So, so far, so good. So, it's a persistent hash map. This is the core. Now let's work towards the next layer. This one is gonna require a lot of goofing around with the command line and a lot of looking at hashes, so please don't even try to follow every, every single step. That's not the point. The point is the structure, okay? Let's say that I start adding files to my project. I have a shell script here that I prepare to to add a few files so that I don't have to do it by hand. And if I look at the project now, there is a readme file. I will zoom in a bit for people who are far away. Okay, and the readme has, contains the string something. And then there is a, an SRC directory which contains two files. The, the first one contains the string something else. Second one is once again something, okay? And now I will quickly add these files 
to the, uh, I will stage this file thing, it speak. I will add them to the index. I will prepare them for commit. If I say git status now, you see that these files are ready to go up. And now I can commit. And I will give this commit a message with the minus m switch. It's going to be called first. There it goes. And if you ask once again, how many objects are in the database, this time around it's going to come up with five objects. And okay, now the problem is why five? Let's see. I will be using git cut file again, okay? If I say git log, it shows me the commit. And the commit has a hash. Now, what happens if I say git cut file minus t, it's going to say it's a commit, sure. What happens if I say git cut file minus p? What's in a commit? What, I, I'm talking about the implementation of a commit in Git. What do you expect to find in there? Hmm? OK. Metadata, the commit message, the, uh, the author, hmm? the date of the commit, they, are, they must be in there. OK? And if I ask for it, I'm sorry that it's on multiple lines, a bit hard to read, but this makes it bigger, you will see that exactly this text is the commit. I mean, literally, Git takes this text, hashes it, zips it, wraps it in a, blah, in a header, blah, blah, and it becomes an object in the database. And most of this is obvious, okay? This is me, the, that's the date, this is the, the commit message. The first line is not as obvious. What's a tree? A tree, quickly, is uh, the equivalent in Git of a directory. A blob, you can see it as a file. A tree is like a directory. In this case, it's the root of your project, OK? So now let's, let me do this again with the tree. So git cat file minus p hash of the tree. This is a tree. Remember, this is the root of your project, OK? What's in the root of your project? Another tree, the SRC directory, and the blob, readme. Okay? Let me do this one last time with the readme. Do you happen to remember this hash? Something. So. Let's look at this graphically to make it easy to follow, hopefully. You have a comment. It's called first. It references a tree. It's called uh, E7, blah, blah. And it's actually the root of your project. This tree is referencing two things. Another tree, source, and the file, readme, which contains the string something. Okay. Source is referencing two files. You remember there were two files inside source, right? One of these is file one, which contains the string something else. That's another object. Where does the last arrow go? The last file contained the string something again. So the last arrow can go straight there. Look at what is happening. Git is reusing the objects. The name of the file is not in the blob. The name of the file is in the tree that contains the blob. So if you have two files that are identical, there will only be one object in Git. This helps make Git efficient. We'll see how. One, a couple of uh, observations. First, there is more than this going on under the hood. I'm saying that Git is creating one object for every file. Actually, every now and then, Git will look into the files and say, hey, these files are al almost identical. Let's put everything that is common into another section of memory uh, of uh, a file. It will, uh, uh, as they say, pack your objects. That's what the pack uh, directory under objects is for. But this is not useful. This is really an implementation detail. You're probably never going to see that. This is more important because it gives you a hint at how Git thinks. 
Another thing that is interesting is that, look at this thing. You have blobs that have content. You have trees that contain more trees and content. And the names of the things are in the trees. What do you call a thing like that? Huh? A file system. This is a damn file system, which is totally unsurprising because the author of this thing is a specialist in file systems. He's a kernel guy, right? So this is a good way to look at Git. It's not a versioning system yet. It's a file system. Okay, it's not what you think about when you think of file systems. You're thinking about something that is more low level, kernel related, kernel level. It's talking directly to uh, mass storage, almost directly. But if you abstract it a bit, remember abstraction is your friend, this is kind of like a file system. Okay? So it's not just a persistent hash map, it's a stupid content tracker file system for friends. Now, one more layer in the onion, versioning. This is going to be brutal, but it starts simple enough. Let's say that I edit the readme file, and I write in here uh, my git project. There. So now we have a new file to add, and we can commit, and we commit with the message second. And if we say git log, we get a hash for this commit. And if we say git cat file minus p and the hash, what's gonna be different in this commit compared to the previous commit, conceptually different? In this case, the commit is not the first commit anymore. It's not a root commit, let's say. So you have something more. You have a parent, which is the first commit, of course. Now, I could go on and use cut file to painstakingly look at each single object in the database, but I will spare you the pain. I will just show you the result here. So, Second commit, it has a parent, and it's pointing to a tree. Is this going to be the same tree that we have here? No. If, you, if you're questioning why, you will see in a second. It's another tree. This tree is pointing to a tree and a blob. The blob is clearly different, okay? Because it's new content, my Git project. That's why this tree has to be different, because Git is calculating the shown of the tree, and the content of the tree is different, because the blob is different. What about SRC? Is this the same SRC or another one? This one is the same one, okay? So look at the way that Git builds history into the mix. If you look at this entire thing, let me move back and forth because I, I'm sorry, guys. I love you too. Forget about that stuff. Forget about that stuff because it, if you look at the, this entire thing from here, from the point of view of the second comet, you can't reach this thing unless you go to the parent and then go over you don't see this stuff. What you see is the stuff that you can reach from here, which means this. And if you look at this, this is a snapshot of your file system in time. So Git is reusing whatever it can reuse, but what you end up with is each commit is the whole snapshot of the whole project. Okay? Forget about trees and forget about blobs, mainly because you know it all now. You are experts when it comes to the Git object model. Trees, blobs, commits, and then there is another kind of object that is called the annotated tag, which is very easy, by the way. You can look it up yourself. This is all there is to know about the Git object model. There is quite simply nothing else in there. You know it all. Now let's 
move up a level and look at the comets instead, focus on the comets. One thing that we don't know yet, you know that Git is famous for branching. We don't know what a branch is. What's a branch? I mean, let me go back to the command line. Let me see what we have here. If I say git branch, it will list all the branches, and we only have one branch because we are at the very beginning. It's called the master, OK? And if I create another branch, fix me, there now we have two branches. But what are these concretely? Let's look inside the dot git folder. This is instructive. So I think I have something here. There, let's forget about the object database. There is a folder here that's called refs, for references. And if you look inside it, you will see that it has a couple of subfolders, forget about tags. There is one that is called heads. And if you look inside that one, you will see two files that are fix me and master. What do you expect to find inside those two files if I print them on the screen? Ashes, ashes. So let me double check for the non-believers. Cat.git um, refs heads master a hash. And by the way, the hash of the latest commit. What if I ask for fix me instead? Same hash. So branches are just the references. In general, references to a hash. Now, we are still missing something. When I say git branch, uh, these two branches are not the same. One is all happy and green, and the other one is all white and sad. Because one is the current branch, right? How does Git know what the current branch is? Yeah. I wanted to, to get there in two questions, but you guys short circuit me. Um, there, is, there must be another reference, right? There must be a reference to a branch, which is a reference to a commit. And this reference is saying, this is the current branch. What's the name of this reference? A file named head, just by coincidence, is here, right in the root of the git folder. In here, you won't generally find a shown, because it's as referencing a branch, which is not an object in Git's database. It's a file in the refs folder. So Git is using this other syntax here to say this is the reference. But this is it, OK? From an implementation point of view, you just became the experts. This is all there is to know about branches. The consequences, however, can, be, can take some time to be understood. Let's see. I'm going to change my style and not use the command line anymore because uh, this would uh, uh, force me to switch back and forth a lot and it would get annoying for you. I would instead show you the commands on the screen and uh, I will show you what happens inside Git there. We said that we have a branch named master, which is a reference, and we have a reference to the reference, which is head. And then we have another reference once, once we say git branch fixes, that is called fixes, OK? So what happens now if I change some stuff in the command line, for example, I edit a file, and then I say git commit minus a, which stands for add everything new, so I can skip the git add part, minus m third. What is happening here? Well, I'm creating a new commit. So the new commit will be, let's say, here. I'm bending it sideways because uh, of what comes later. This is brand new, and it's a commit that has as a parent the previous current commit, the one pointed at by head, which is pointing at master, which is pointing at it. 
uh, what happens to head? Actually, no. Nothing happens to head. Why should it change? It was pointing at master. It's the current branch. It's still the current branch. What is changing is master, which is now pointing here. Head is just following along for the ride. So now what happens if I say git checkout fixes? What does git checkout do concretely? That's all it does. It moves head to the fixes branch, like this. And yes, uh, thank you, Smartass. Almost as a side effect, when you change head and you are pointing at a different thing, Git says, hey, the contents of this working directory don't match what I see here in the object database. You know what the object database is worth? Everything. You know what your PANI files are worth? Nothing. Let me delete everything that is in here and replace it. Well, maybe if I see stuff that hasn't been committed, I will warn you, but otherwise I don't care about your working directory. Git really considers that very transient. So it will just say, let me walk this commit just like we did earlier on and check all the trees and all the blobs and turn them into folders and files and dump everything into the working directory. Actually, <laughs> good. You have a career in front of you, so. Okay, now what happens if I change stuff now and I, I create another commit? Now you know what happens. First, the new commit. Let's put it here because the parent of the new commit is always the current commit. And of course, master is going to stay there. Head is going to stay there, but fixes is going to move. What happens now if I say git merge? Think about what git is trying to achieve. What we are trying to achieve is, I want to have a point in time, a commit, where everything that is available in master is also available there. And everything that is available in fix me is also available there. So if there are no conflicts, the easiest way to get to that point is to just create another commit which has two parents, like this. I won't bore you with the details, but you can probably draw a pretty picture yourself of how this commit is pointing to a brand new tree, the root, which is new. But this root is pointing to stuff that was already there. And if there are conflicts, it's pointing to stuff that is new because it solves the conflicts. Is this uh, clear? Okay. Probably no need for more details. What is important here is that fixes the current branch is going to move to the merge, okay? Now, let's check out master again. What happens now if I say git merge fixes? Okay, again, what are we trying to achieve? We are trying to get a point in time where everything is available that is also available in both master and fixes. But we already have this point in time, right? It's there. It's the topmost commit. So we don't need to create new commits with parents or stuff like that. Git is smart enough to say, hey, I'm going to use what I have. So what it does is that it just takes master and it moves it to the top of the chain. This is called, by the way, a fast forward. If you're just learning Git, and banging your head against the wall, trying to understand what the fast forward is, nothing magic. This is it. Pretty. Now let's look at another situation quickly, and then we are done with this version in silliness, OK? This is the other situation. Imagine we have this situation in our, in our project. We have a first commit, and then we branched. Somebody branched the fixes, probably. And uh, this person committed fixed and more fixed, while another person committed second and third, or maybe the same person while switching branches, okay? And we are left like this. 
And right now we're on fixes. What happens if I say git rebase master? What's a rebase? This is what you want to do. What you would like to do is to take this connection, the connection between fix and first, cut it off, break it, and move it to third. Rebasing, right? I want to change the base of this chain, okay? So you want to do this. That's what you want to do, but you can't. I mean, you can't go in into the commit fix, change the commit, and be done with it. Why can't you? You get a different shown. As soon as you change one single byte, you get a completely different shown. That's why everything in Git is immutable. Everything in the object database is immutable. So what can you do instead? If you can't do this and you want to get something like this, what you can do instead is to copy over stuff to new commits, which pretend that they are the old commits. So what you do is to take fix and create a new commit which is exactly like fix. It's pointing to the same tree, it has the same OZOR and blah, 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 but it has a different parent. But it needs to be a different object because it has a different shown. Is this point clear? Because this point is the point that might drive you crazy the moment that you mix rebasing with distribution. That's when pain happens if you don't understand this thing. That this is not the same commit, it's a copy. Do you ever find yourself with multiple commits with the same messages in your Git tree? And you were wondering where, these, where do these come from? That's where they come from. I'm not going into the mechanics by which this can happen, but unfortunately it does happen. Uh, also, you need to copy more fix. Hmm? And you need to move fixes to the top. One last question about versioning, and then we're done with versioning. What happens to those commits, to the original ones? Like in object-oriented programming languages, if something is there but unreachable, there is no way to get there by a branch or a tag, eventually Git will say this stuff is old and it will garbage collect it. So they're gonna die sooner or later. Maybe they will take a long time, but what if you want to save them for whatever reason? I don't have a slide for that, but if you want to make something reachable so that it's never garbage collected, just stick a branch on it. It will be there forever because now it's always reachable. And that, and a lot of special cases, is all there is to know about versioning in Git. And we are done with the next layer of the onion. All we are left with now, distribution. If we had more time, I would go into the details of how distribution is implemented. But we don't have much time, so forgive me, I will skip the internals. I will just show you the basic idea because now the basic idea comes on very smoothly. Imagine that you have a local repo and a remote repo. I know that computers don't look like this anymore, but I'm an old man, okay? And uh, imagine that you want to clone the remote on the local. Those pretty colorful things are objects. I just call them differently instead of putting different shows on them. It's more readable for humans. You will notice that there is no magenta ball because magenta is not a damn color. What happens physically when you get clone? Yeah, if you want to approximate just a tiny little bit, 
you just copy over dot git folder. It's not quite that simple, but almost. For sure, you copy over all the objects. And bang, you have your own repo with all the history. I didn't draw the graph, but of course these objects are all connected, okay? Then some time passes. Some time passes and the two databases evolve. People are working on the two, on the two repos. So now in the local we have this pink ball and this last line, okay, that the remote doesn't have and the remote has things that we don't have. But remember what we said in the beginning. These things are unique in the universe. They have a show. So how do I align with the remote? How do I get the stuff in the remote? What happens when I do a git fetch, in other words? Oh, essentially, you ask the remote, may you please send me all the stuff that you have and I don't, all those objects, and bang, perfect. You usually don't do a git fetch, you do a git pull, which means git fetch and then merge, because things are just a little bit more complicated in that there are local branches and remote branches. So after fetching the new stuff, you want to get them in your history, and that you do by merging, essentially. Local branches, remote branches, whatever they are branches, okay? There is a simple system to tell Git how to track which branch with, this, with which branch, but essentially it's the same mechanics, mechanism you've seen before. Uh, what happens then when I do a git push? Same thing in the other direction. Take this stuff, it's new, you don't have it. And that's distribution. May it be so simple. Yes, it's really so simple. That's it. We have the onion. Now, you might wonder, after rebuilding the entire onion, so why are you telling me this stuff? Why am I supposed to care about this stuff? Usually in a presentation you tell the why beforehand because I'm supposed to motivate you, but I thought, come on, and we are all geeks, git internals, <laughs> you don't need any more motivation, and indeed you've been following, right? But in the end, I, I, I feel I need to motivate that. And the basic thing is that when you learn Git, like pretty much anything else, you go through, you can uh, abstract it as three stages, okay? The first stage, you are inexperienced, okay? This is me being inexperienced. So I'm starting to play with Git. Hey, it's not as hard as I thought. Okay, I, I don't know, rebase, ooh, the, that wasn't his subversion. Okay, I will merge, I know what that is. And so on and so on, okay? And I was feeling all happy. Then you get to a point where you are experienced, but compared to other uh, technologies where experience means that you get more and more command, in Git experience, experience looks more like this, okay? <laughs> oh, I broke the project repo, what do I do now? Oh my God, something bad happened. People are probably gonna blame me. And only then, if you can hold on to this, you get to a stage of fluency, where you go like, okay, I'm not understanding, but I know how things fit together. I, I know how Git organizes trees and blobs let, and comets, more importantly, let me draw this, okay, now I can make sense of this. And now I can actually work with Git fluently. Okay? And to get from the second step, the second stage of experience, but often in trouble, to the stage where, okay, I know what I'm doing, give me some time and I will sort it out. You need to know the internals, you need to know the basics. Like Ruby metaprogramming, in a Git, what is important is the model. If you own the model, you can make sense of any special case. If you don't understand the model, then each special case is gonna be its own particular tar pit, and your life is gonna be miserable. I know, because mine was. 
So this takes care of the very latest layer. Now we're done. Okay? Thank you.